Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Smart and Sustainable City podcast. And we have a very special guest today, uh, Thomas. Welcome. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Could you um, introduce yourself? Um, my name is Tom Dodd. I'm British, but also now Belgian. I, I work in the European Commission. Specifically, I work in the part of the European Commission that actually mainly regulates uh, the financial sector. But within that, um, within that department, I coordinate a small team of four or five people who work on rules for corporate sustainability reporting. So European rules about the social and environmental information that, that companies have to report. So with a focus on the financial system, but also resonating with the European Green Deal, your Directorate General has recently been involved in uh, writing up and moving forward with some new EU policies linked to sustainability, right? That's right. Um, now the, the, the part that I and colleagues deal with specifically are, are the new rules on uh, what we call corporate sustainability reporting. So this is the corporate sustainability reporting directive which the European Parliament and the member states in, in the Council um, agreed in the middle of last year, agreed in the middle of uh, 2023. Um, it essentially revises and strengthens some existing corporate sustainability reporting requirements in EU law. So we, we are not, we were not starting from zero. Um, some large companies have to some extent been subject to certain EU requirements to include sustainability information in their annual reports already. Um, but this new directive goes quite a long way in terms of um, uh, specifying in more detail the requirements that are on those companies and introduces another uh, a, a number of other quite important modifications. Um, as I said, that, that legislation was agreed in the middle of last year, and we're now just in the middle of bringing it on stream in terms of practical implementation. So it was issued at a European level, and it is now in the phase where it's being rolled out in all of the European countries. Is this where we're at? Yes. Uh, as always, it's a little bit more complex than that, that but th that, that is true. So it, it is in what we, in, in our EU jar jargon, we call a directive. That means that it does have to be transposed into national law. So that means each member state has to pass its own national laws that implement um, the requirements of, of, that directive, uh, of that directive. And that process is ongoing and we have periodic discussions with representatives from national administrations to check that their understanding and our understanding of what the directive requires um, is is more or less the same so that that, that process goes on um, the the other important part of implementation really relates to the single most important part of this directive which is to say that, uh, European companies caught by this law will have to report according to mandatory common European uh, reporting standards. Um, so these are what we call ESRS, European Sustainability Reporting Standards. Um, and this summer, so at the end of July, the European Commission approved the first set of ESRS, so the first set of European sustainability reporting standards. And this is the detail. So the, the directive sets the principles, but a company can't really pick up the directive and know what to report. The, the company picks up the standards, the company picks up the ESRS, and there is the detail of what an individual company has to report about what issues. We adopted a first set of, of standards at the end of July. We now have to wait 
um, until later this month to receive the, hopefully, the no objection of both the council, that's the member states, and the European Parliament. They, they, they can't actually change the terms of the standards, but they could object to it if they, if, if they fundamentally disapprove of, of what we have proposed. So, so that is the, the key aspect of implementation that we are uh, in the middle of at the moment. All right, Tom. So there was the European Green Deal kind of sets the scene. Uh, your group, your directorate uh, has been uh, putting forward this uh, CSRD, this directive, which has been voted by the European Parliament and which is being passed on now to each of the European countries to so that it can be put into local law. And applied to this directive are measurement metrics, right? They're called ESRS, KPIs, yeah. how would you call them? Yeah, they're KPIs and more. Okay. Um, I mean, a KPI implies, doesn't it, a numerical metric. Now, within these standards, there are, of course, numerical metrics, um, but there, there, are, there is considerably more than that. Um, so not only, if we translate it into sort of reality, not only would a company need to disclose metrics on its greenhouse gas emissions, it would also need to provide a narrative account of uh, the uh, climate-related risks to which it might be exposed um, and, and, and various other elements. So it's not just numbers. Okay. And does this apply to, we're going to uh, discuss who, who does this apply to, but is it in general terms applicable only to private companies or do you foresee that the public sector or public owned companies will have to comply with uh, this directive as well over time? So it's, it's limited liability companies. That's in essence, um, but per perhaps I should dig into this a bit, a bit more. So the shorthand that we use is all large companies and all listed companies. So the, the, the large companies are actually defined as companies that exceed two out of three criteria. And those criteria are 250 employees, um, 40 million euro turnover, 20 million euro balance sheet. Now, if you if you exceed two out of those three, you are, um, in our interpretation, a large company. So all large companies uh, established within the, within the EU would need to meet these reporting requirements. Then we have all listed companies. And why we make that a slightly separate category is because listed companies would have to meet these reporting requirements, even if they're small. Unless they're very, very small micro companies, but, but okay, that's a, um, a detail we probably don't need to dwell on. So, so listed SMEs, listed small and medium-sized enterprises, um, would also have to uh, would also have to report. And there, and there are companies which are headquartered outside of the European Union. What do those companies have to report then uh, under the CSRD? Okay, now you're going to have to forgive me here because this is important, but not always simple to explain. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, the, I think that there's probably three scenarios we need to think about. Okay, the first, you might have a non-EU company, not established in the EU, but nevertheless has shares or other securities listed on EU markets. If that's the case, they need to report according to European sustainability reporting standards, like all other companies with shares or other securities listed in the EU. So that's, that's the first case. We then have a, uh, a second case, which may be a, a, a company uh, not established in the EU, but that generates above 150 million euros in revenue on the EU market through, through goods and services it sells, and has either a large branch or a large subsidiary located in the EU. 
And in that case, the branch or subsidiary of that non-EU company would indeed need to publish a report on behalf of the parent company. That requirement actually doesn't kick in until 2028, 2029. Um, and there would be separate standards covering those, those non-EU companies. But the reason why the council and the parliament wanted to have this provision um, was to ensure a certain degree of level playing field for companies that make profit on the EU market. And also for questions of accountability that, that along the system, um, it's important that EU citizens can ultimately have access to the sustainability impacts of the different goods and services that they that they purchase. And that, and that should apply irrespective of whether the the good or service is provided or made by a European or non-European company. Um, now, there is a third case, which is simply the EU subsidiary of a non-EU company. What happens there? Now, the default is that the EU subsidiary of a non-EU company is a legally established a, sorry, is a legally established EU company. So the default is it's treated like any other EU company. And if it's, if it's large, it will have to report. The, the, the situation is slightly more subtle, however, because we have a provision that says, if the parent company of a, subsid of a subsidiary decides to report on a consolidated basis for the group of companies as a whole, then the individual subsidiary doesn't have to report. There's no obligation, but they can use this option. Now, you, you follow the logic. If the parent and the subsidiary collectively decide to use that option, then the non-EU parent would have to report according to European sustainability reporting standards. So I hope totally that's not too confusing an answer to your question. Uh, no, no, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's great to get that level of detail. It's and. I, I, I think it, it is well documented on your website, but you know, for you to clarify it, to crystallize it, um, is is really important. Just to um, for our uh, auditors' understanding, let's pick a, a company that's let's take an example that is headquartered in the U.S. and that has a you know a business that is. Uh, significant worldwide, but it has a small subsidiary in in Europe. Uh, as of what type of uh, business level would that company need to report uh, under the C CSRD or well, under this directive? So it, it it would all depend on the size of the subsidiary. Okay. So if the subsidiary is not a large European company then there are no reporting obligations okay. that, 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 that would apply. Um, if the subsidiary is a large European company, then that subsidiary, and I, and I suppose the US parent would need to make a decision. And the decision is, do you leave the EU subsidiary to report on its own for its own operations, which would be compliant with EU law? Or does the parent say, no, actually, we as the parent company prefer to provide a consolidated report covering this subsidiary and others that we may have around the world, and in which case uh, they would need to apply European sustainability reporting standards to, right. to do that. Okay, let's thank you. Thank you. That, that's extremely clear. And uh, thank, thank you for. Uh, explaining it so so well in terms of reporting obligations so companies that uh, fall under this directive will have to report um so to whom do they need to report by when do they need to report and what are the consequences if they don't report is this a bit will they could you envisage some penalty a bit like gdpr if they don't report well they they're breaking the law so there will be penalties uh, involved or okay not? Yeah, no, there's a, I'm just noting that because there's, there's, there's quite a lot of questions there. We should do them one by one, otherwise, otherwise I'll get lost. Uh, never mind your listeners. Um, so, so firstly, for whom? 
uh, I think it's a very, very important question. Um, and the, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive uh, explains this in, in reasonable detail. The, the, the first target audience of the reported information is essentially investors, the financial markets. Now, they need this information partly to understand the risks to which they might be exposed. Okay, uh, again, climate's always the easy example. The standards cover much more than climate, but um, if a com let, let, let's make it really simple. Company has built a fantastic new production facility, but it happens to be on a beach at sea level somewhere. It may be exposed to rising sea levels in the future. So that's the kind of information that an investor needs to know about. Um, investors also need to know actually about the, the sustainability impacts of the company because many investors are selling financial products on the basis of the fact that they're sustainable. Now you, you, you can't do that unless you know something about the, the impacts of your investment portfolio. Um, so one of the, sorry, the, the first target audience, as I said, is the financial market investors. But the, the EU law is quite explicit that the target audience goes beyond that. The target audience is also other stakeholders, such as workers' representatives and trade unions, who are very interested in having greater transparency about whether and how companies um, ensure respect for labor standards and so on and so forth. Uh, target audience also includes civil society organizations who are, or some of whom are in one way or another keen to hold companies to account for their impacts on people. And perhaps more indirectly, target audience includes individual citizens. Now that probably doesn't mean that there are many EU citizens who will pick up and read company sustainability reports, although some will. Although some increasingly, will. yeah. Increasingly, increasingly yeah. Interested in. um, but they may also get this, the, the, the information filtered through other sources, including, including media, um, of course. So, so that's, the, that's the, the for whom is the information intended. Note that the information in this case is not, it's, it's, it's not for people like me, or it's, it's not for organizations like the European Commission itself. This is information that is designed to be put out for the markets in the public sphere. It's, it's, it's not being information being produced um, for public authorities uh, and, and, and for the good of the public authorities. That's, that's not the intention here. Um, by when? Now, the, the by when depends on, ultimately on the, on the size of the company. Um, so the, the requirements are phased in according to the size of company. So we, we start with companies, those companies that are or were already subject to those European sustainability reporting requirements that I talked about at the beginning, the, the requirements that not very precise, but were already in EU law. And that basically means um, listed companies, sorry, large listed companies, large banks, large insurance companies, all of them, if they have more than 500 employees. So that's that's more or less the the, the first group of companies. They that's about eleven thousand five hundred companies. Something like that. In, you, in Europe. You've got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They need to report um, for financial year twenty twenty four, meaning reports actually published twenty twenty five. So they are the first ones to go. In the following year, so that's financial year 2025 and reports published 2026, you have all other large European companies, which is mainly, and I'm simplifying here, that's mainly the large non-listed companies. A year after that, so now we're getting to financial year 2026 and reports published 2027, you have the listed SMEs. Um, and in fact, the listed SMEs have a further two years after that, during which they may, if they wish, voluntarily opt out from the requirements. 
So the last date by which they must apply, if I'm not mistaken, is financial year 2028. And when they report, do they they need to report within two months, within three months, six months of the uh, of that fiscal year? So they report as part of their what is in effect their annual report together with their financial statements and management report. But the intention is to have those sustainability reports published at the same time financial reports are being yes. published for the Correct. company. So it's, it will be at the same level of uh, compliance or demands yeah. that a company so, reports sustainability. Yeah. So, so f first of all, that's deliberate that the the timing should be the same. Um, but the, the the point you make is is extremely important about sort of parallels between financial reporting and sustainability reporting. Now, we we often say that the intention here is to put sustainability reporting ultimately on the same footing as financial reporting. Um, that has all kinds of implications in terms of the rigor that we expect uh, in terms of the existence simply of reporting standards, which of course we have and have been accepted for a long time for financial reporting. And that's one reason why we now bring in that same kind of discipline into uh, sustainability reporting. I think I mean, the parallel is worth exploring further because there, there are some important um, some important implications of it. One of which actually is is how important is this information to the company internally? Um, now, for financial reporting, companies use the reported information for their own strategic purposes, right? The the board of a company. Uh, uses that same financial information that is reported to quite a large extent in order to discuss the progress of the company, the health of the company, where it might be going and make strategic. Now, where we want to get to is that European companies are doing the same with sustainability information. So, of course, at the beginning, there will be compliance costs for sustainability reporting. And of course, for, for companies that have not done this before, to some extent, it may feel like a compliance exercise. But the, the objective is, 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 is much beyond legal compliance. We want to be in a situation where boards and company management are collecting, reviewing, and valuing this sustainability information because it is fundamental to the company's strategy, to the way the company is run, um, and it, it is influencing uh, their decisions about the future. And it will be good for cities, it will be good for Europe, it will be good for, for the planet. So it's, it's really aligned to that uh, EU uh, Green Deal. Uh, tell me about the consequences you can think about mm. if companies actually do not report uh, or don't report appropriately those, uh, their progress under the CSRD framework. That's actually a, a either very short or a very long answer, but I'm going to give you the very short one, which is that it is it is at the discretion of EU member states. Um, the longer answer is that uh, when the European Commission proposed this legislation, it did include some provisions about setting the sort of mi some minimal um, uh, minimum sanctions. But member states have very different traditions about how they enforce corporate reporting requirements, including for financial reporting. Um, and ultimately, they were very reluctant in the case of sustainability reporting um, to introduce European-wide provisions on exactly how this should be done. But the, the traditions are genuinely quite different from member state to member state. That's not to judge whether one is better than another. Um, some rely on enforcement agencies, some rely simply on the courts. Um, so it, it, uh, it's quite challenging to, to introduce common European-wide provisions on the sanctions. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready is... to, to bet that there will be uh, some countries that will enforce some penalties and, and some countries are more um, willing to enforce those. Um, and we've seen that with GDPR. I mean, GDPR can be quite a can can 
can really impact a company uh, in terms of possible penalties. But th don't I, you think I, I there's should... also reputational risk? I mean, if a company doesn't actually report properly and the or very get its its sustainability efforts verified under CSRD, uh, it also has an impact on it, their reputation, on their on their brand in the market. Um... The short answer is probably yes, but I think we're all going to learn over the next few years of practical implementation. Um, I think we'll all be on quite a steep learning curve. That will include the companies. It will probably include the, the users of, of this reported information. It will also, I'm sure, include the different um, uh, organizations responsible for enforcement of these reporting requirements. I, I should, Pierre, I should, important for, for me to qualify um, one point on enforcement. Um, while discretion is given to member states generally, they must have what we call national competent authorities to supervise and enforce these requirements in the case of listed companies. So in the case of listed companies, there's much less discretion given to, to uh, member states. In the case of... Um, uh, private companies is where national practices diverge uh, much more considerably. Um, and there are governmental you, organizations that yeah. will be in each country responsible yeah. for that enforcement. I saw in France is the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, so financial exactly. market authority that is overseeing um, this. Yeah. Now, we, you, you mentioned also the question of verification, um, which is a uh, really one of the other central innovations of, of the directive, of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, so the, 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 the key message is that this information will have to be audited or assured, as we say. Um, that has not previously been the case of sustainability information under European law. Um, and it is, of course, another element of seeking these parallels between financial reporting and sustainability reporting. Everyone accepts that financial reports have to be audited. Um, so we go in the same direction with um, sustainability reports. It, 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 it will occur to some extent in, in a gradual way because the, the audit world makes a distinction between what they call limited assurance, which is less strict audit, and reasonable assurance, which is a more demanding level of, of audit. And European law starts with a requirement for limited assurance and will move to uh, reasonable assurance uh, over time. Um, but Right, Tom, so I'm, I'm thinking for an SME, you know, they will have to jump into this and some of them are more advanced than others depending on the country and depending on their situation, on their sustainability practice, what, who should they turn to to be more informed, be more in control of their sustainability practice so that it aligns to the compliance expectation to CSRD? Um, any advice, any thoughts, any best practice on who to turn to uh, for this? Well. Important to point out that the only SMEs that will be subject to legal requirements under the CSRD are the 1,000 or so listed SMEs in Europe. And remember that they um, have until 2026 plus a further two years if they want before they have to be um, reporting. Um, now, I think there will be different sources of advice and help for companies of that kind. Much of the best advice and support for SMEs, of course, um, comes in a culturally tailored way uh, at national level. We also have the technical um, advisory body that advises us on the development of European standards called EFRAG, and EFRAG is developing um, implementation guidance to accompany the standards and they will continue to develop that over the over the coming years so that will be certainly one important source um, 
of advice. Um, and I think there, there will obviously be also be some uh, private offer of uh, advice and help for, for companies to not simply on sustainability reporting, but on, on sustainability generally. But also there is a good source of information, I must say, on the European uh, Commission's website uh, around CSRD and uh, has a few uh, Q&A uh, resources there that are worth uh, checking for, for our auditors. There's, there's one thing that um, struck me when I looked at that website is the, um, the level of depth of information that needed to be reported. And, um, and it says uh, that it needs to be material for the company. And uh, I, I wonder whether you could um, uh, enlighten us about what depth of information would need to be reported. Is it going to the very final detail of everything and scope three, for example, upstream and downstream? Uh, how far should a company think of going in terms of reporting its sustainability uh, impact? So the, the, the basic point here is that the, the standards themselves are reasonably detailed and reasonably precise, because that is the only way that we can ensure that the informa reported information is comparable and that the reported information is complete and accurate. And of course, if the reported information isn't comparable, isn't complete, isn't accurate, we can't achieve what we're trying to achieve here. So, so once you start standardizing reported information, you need to go a, a, a reasonably far distance in terms of um, the level of detail. However, the great majority of this information is, is what we call subject to materiality. So it is um, deliberately designed to give both the flexibility and the responsibility to companies to make a decision about what of all this information is actually relevant in my particular circumstances. But the, the underlying point is that no, a company is not expected to report all information about all its value chain or all its supply chain. That's not the point. The company is, is expected, nevertheless, to identify where there may be important risks or impacts through that value chain. And then with regard to those so-called hotspots, to report the information that the standards require. So, Tom, is there any thoughts about providing guidance to those companies which are maybe not obligated to report, but that would want to report their sustainability progress just to have a better impact on their community, on their customers, on their business? Um, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, short answer is yes, there is. So, so we're, we're really talking here about the 20 million or more non-listed SMEs in Europe. Now, they, they are not subject to legal requirements under this legislation, legal reporting requirements, but we all know and see that many of those companies are nevertheless subject to expectations from banks uh, or perhaps from large companies that they supply uh, or from other stakeholders to be providing certain sustainability information, even if they're not legally obliged to be reporting this. Um, so we are working with EFRAG, the, the, the body that advises us on ESRS, to develop um, standards for voluntary use by non-listed SMEs. Now, the, the, the idea, of course, that these standards would be uh, simple, considerably simpler than the standards for large companies um, that would be attractive for use by different SMEs and would at the same time in the market help meet the, the need coming from the financial sector and others for certain sustainability information from, from these companies. It, it, in a way, if you like, it, it would both encourage and facilitate the participation of smaller companies in the, in the transition to a sustainable economy. 
Tom Todd from DG FESMA from the European Commission. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.